hey, I'm Lerp, it's like played Counter-Strike for a living for eight years. I've been on the desk for some of the biggest events for five years. I know nothing about Counter-Strike, but then again, neither does Story. Welcome to his YouTube channel. Right, this is going to be another one of my Patreon donated discussions. And as is tradition, we have a smaller group on this one, but we got a new person. And if people know, the new people always have to come and give us a topic or some angle, because obviously we want fresh blood, as it were. So, Zach, for this one... One thing I always also say is when you introduce yourself, maybe just give us like your background, like what games do you follow? What esports are you interested in? And then if you've got a topic and kick us off, it'd be great. All right. My pleasure. So I, uh, believe it or not, I am a current day Team Fortress 2 pro player and using the word pro a okay. little loosely, but I'm, uh, I play Highlander, which is the nine versus nine format. And my teams have placed top three and invite for the past like year and a half so that's definitely my uh home base and other than that i'm a big counter-strike fan or i started following in 20 2014 about halfway through 2014 right. but i haven't followed the online era as much oh just on the team fortress 2 angle actually because i mean a lot of other people obviously won't even be aware that that is like actually a competitive game etc because at this point it's sort of like I mean, old school Quake and stuff that like there's still small scenes. It's just it's more like semi pro and unofficial, you know. The question I have about about that is basically, as far as I know, I didn't follow Team Fortress, but as far as I know, didn't basically the whole top tier sort of go to Overwatch and try and become pros in Overwatch League? Uh, yes and no. There was a good number of people, and we kind of were hoping in a lot of ways that it was like the promised land, right? So there were a lot of big names that went over and a lot of other names that tried to go over. But, you know, a lot of the, I would say the majority ended up either staying or just retiring naturally. Okay. Is, of the people who actually went to the Overwatch League, who who actually, was the one person who was sort of like a god of fucking TF2 and then they went to Overwatch League? So I know a bunch of them said they were good, but you never know from the players how good they actually were, you know? Right. Mm, I think Seagull is definitely a name that people know sure. where he was so wonderful in Team Fortress 2 and like, you know, kind of blasted the scene open where people thought, whoa, what a what a creative player and how how excellent to watch him play. So I think to lose him once he was really hitting his stride was something. Um, another name is Clockwork was uh, oh, sure, you know, of course, like the yeah. best of all time and uh, one of the best of all time. Anyway, it's a little bit up for debate, but yeah, really so exciting to watch him play Scout in Team Fortress 2. But um you know, with Overwatch going the way it's going, we've been seeing a few people return to Team Fortress 2. So I'm getting to play with a couple Fair Overwatch enough. players now. So uh, that's funny how, uh, what kind of timeline we ended up in here, huh? Do you have uh, a, like an opening topic you'd like to talk about? Could be in CSGO, of course, if you want. Uh, yeah, I actually have been um, dying to talk a little bit more about what's going on with Hunden and Heroic, if we could start there. All right. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I guess my... Um, you know, I'm not sure if maybe I missed part of the conversation or if maybe it's as simple as it seems, but I'm not really sure what Hunden is actually is exactly after, right? Like, what does he have to gain by coming right. out and speaking now? Right. Well, basically, the problem with this story is obviously, like, the details were staggered over at this point in time, probably like a bloody one-year span or something. If you think about when the first initial accusations were made, and then, he, interestingly enough, he was one of the people, if I remember rightly, who got his sentence shortened because he actually sort of also came to some people and said the bug existed, even though he used it. And then, basically, even though at the time when all those coaches got the ban, even though people sort of did out loud multiple times verbalize, like, mm, couldn't, wouldn't some of the players have known? The problem was there was no way to enforce that. Like, obviously, you could see that the coach did it because in the demo, but we, unless, I, I mean, people claimed certain tournaments that they listened to some of the comms and there was nothing there. Obviously, Heroic, the org, claimed to have done some sort of an investigation. Like, oh, well, after policing ourselves, we found that we were innocent. Oh, brilliant. And then they just fucking continued on. So the bit, the, I, I know what you mean in that quite sense, right? Of like, basically, if Hunden's fucked anyway, what does it really like benefit him to sort of drag other people down to hell with him, as it were, you know? So there's two angles on this. One, which in theory has no evidence to it, is the theory that me and Richard had, which was more just knowing who Nicola Nyholm and Astralis are, where because technically... The team that Hunden shared the folder access with was Astralis, but nobody opened it. Right now, here's the thing: on the for surface, there, if you don't know Nicola and I'm an Astralis, that actually, if anything, is like right. Well, Astralis is innocent, right? He shared it, but how can we even know that actually they asked him to? Maybe he just did that maliciously to bring Astralis into. It. Even though, to be fair, he never said that, so that wouldn't quite work. But basically, the fact that they didn't open it alone 
Here's the problem. I went the other way on that one initially when I was trying to get, like, use my journalistic instincts. And I thought, right, well, if anything, that's how smart Nikola Nyom actually is compared to these bozos. What he's done is he's basically convinced Hunden to destroy Heroic, which if you don't know, Heroic actually was at one point in time another team created and owned by the Nyom and his group of people before Valve said he couldn't own multiple teams. So if anything, it's like, right, I'm going to use this guy to destroy not only a rival of my team, but basically my old baby that I'm not allowed to have anymore. So fuck it, no one gets to have it if I can't have it and I'll get this idiot because by the way Hunden is a very smart player in the game and at scouting players but he appears to be a bumbling idiot an actual buffoon outside of the game I'll get this fucking moron to think he can join my team as though I'm ever going to let him do that after he cheated and then I'll get him to fuck heroic and then my analogy is when he leaves the bank with his stripy top on I'm in the getaway car, like, oh, come over here, Hunden. But then I just lock the doors before he gets in and I drive off and then the police just pick him up. But then I also tell him, but you know what, I'll take care of you later. So he's stupid enough that, you know, in the police interview, he doesn't bother mentioning me. He just, just says it was all it was all heroic that, and that's why he did it. So basically, as far as I can tell, though, the investigations people like Richard have done, they've said this on, on in videos, I believe, imply that actually... There isn't probably any evidence to that. That's just a speculation, you know. So it appears, as far as we could tell, I still think there's a little bit of fuckery maybe behind the scenes. Like, essentially, Hunden is just an asshole. He's just a piece of shit. So as in, once he realised he just can't have a job anymore, and probably more importantly, once the heroic org sort of turned on him and tried to sort of like make him look even worse, he just sort of thought, right, well, if I'm going down, I'll just take as many people as I can. So unfortunately, I don't actually think he has anything against the players themselves. I think they were just a tool to get back at the heroic org. And my analogy would be, like, obviously, people will know cases where, like, a, um, a, a marriage breaks up and then often the woman might use the children as a pawn in a game to fuck the father over, you know? So maybe he isn't a bad dad, but since she's leaving him because maybe he cheated on her or something, she tries to get all the custody and give him no custody. So I feel like it's one of those scenarios. Like, he thought to himself, right, I've essentially ruined my own career. And as far as I know, I believe he's even a family man, so he probably needed this job in Couch Strike. And he's not just ruined it, but I don't know anyone officially who would hire him at this point in time. So he just sort of thought, right, I'll just fucking throw gasoline on everything and burn it all on the way out, unfortunately, which, I mean, I can't, I find that kind of fucked up because to me, it's like, either you're someone who just considers yourself truthful, in which case you tell everything when you first get caught, you know, the players knew, they knew, or you're someone who, I, I don't snitch, in which case don't snitch. Because another thing that's really shady is it turns out that basically one of the pieces of evidence he had that the players knew, there was two things. One, he claims that um, he has a, a recording of Nico, the entry fragger who now is in fucking um, OG, basically saying like that they knew about the cheat. And then secondly, there's this thing where this server log supposedly shows that him and Tessus joined the server first and then... The assumption, therefore, is that Tessa shows him, like, right, well, if I die in these spots on the server, you'll be able to do, like, the... Per and he was colluding with him. The problem I've heard is this. One, it seems to me, like, the way he did that call might even have been a setup. Like, he basically just did the call in a shady way because the other guy, as far as I know, didn't know he was being recorded, which might not even be fucking legal in Denmark. I don't know the laws there. And then the part about the Tessa thing, even that, I've heard there's some scoffed elements to that that aren't necessarily how it appears. So the sad thing is, it doesn't even really appear like there's ironclad evidence the players did know. But at this point in time, like the initial things seemed like they said that, the circumstantial evidence, and just the fact that this guy was, in theory, like saying they were. Well, you have to remember, some of these players have never been anyone. People like Cadian were never top players, but they've been in this team that's been number one in the world, beating out top top teams. So essentially, unfortunately, a lot of people want to believe the players cheated and they, you know, everyone in the heroic org was in on it. So that's like my basic overview. That's where I'm at at the moment. Do you have any thoughts on it yourself? Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely following along with like the um, kind of mechanism around him with the tensions between the teams and everything. And yeah, I definitely understand maybe he isn't thinking it through in a strategical sense. But even still, like let's say in a hypothetical situation, he has like hard evidence banged to rights. He got him. Even so, like the small victory of dragging the org's name through the mud after they dragged his through the mud. That's still um, going back to the original Isik investigation where 
effectively he's implicating himself saying that I lied under oath. Like when you asked me yes. before, I said the players don't know anything. Now I say the players do know things. So even if you're hunting, it's like shooting yourself, not just in the foot, but then like getting the second foot just for good measure. It seems. Yeah. The joke is he, as well as putting gasoline everywhere else, he's pouring it on himself, isn't he? Like, <laughs> like he's making sure he goes out with the worst possible rep. And as Richard's pointed out many times, well, sorry, Hunden, when you tell us initially, yeah, I used the bog, but no one else knew. But then later say, actually they knew. Well, now we can't believe anything you fucking say, can we? Like, now we can only go off the evidence. Like, now your testimony is a, like, as an actual witness is fucking worth nothing because it just shows that depending on your circumstances, you will say literally anything, including 180 degree statements. So one of those times you absolutely lied to our faces. So, yeah, I think it makes his reputation even stupider. Like, I think if he'd have handled this a lot more quietly and maybe even just behind the scenes intimate to some people, oh, but, the, you know, the players knew and the org sort of stitched me up. That's why I say this guy's a buffoon, right? I know enough about Counter-Strike that there are organizations that behind the scenes might have been willing to take him on and just not officially have him as a coach or a scout. Like, for example, I think as a scout, he'd be perfect. He doesn't even have to play in the game. He can't even cheat. You just basically tell him, go watch all these tier four players, especially Danish ones, and just come back, maybe play a few matchmaking with them. Just tell us if they're any good. Tell us, like, uh, should, should I pick this guy up? Like, is he actually legit? I think there's people, because that, that skill is worth its weight in gold. That could have gotten you hired. Like, if people don't know, in League of Legends, a very similar scenario happened. There was a person um, who worked for Fnatic, one of the biggest European organizations, called Vega V2. And basically, he was supposed to be some like quite clever coach type guy who could like analyze the game. He was working with Fnatic, and basically they had to sort of let him go because it came out like years ago. He'd said some like horrible shit to someone about like their sister who died or something mental like that. Like, or and also it was intimated maybe he'd like messaged underage teens and stuff. So Basically shit that no org could be associated with. But here's the thing. Because he supposedly was some wicked analyst, TSM, who already obviously don't really give a fuck about bad PR because they're basically idiots who've done a lot of shady shit themselves, they just unofficially brought him on. I don't think I don't even know if they ever officially admitted he is used within the team. They might have eventually, but I know he was working with them initially, and he, as far as I know, he still works with them now as part of the coaching stuff. Because again, it's all backroom stuff. That doesn't need to ever appear on broadcast. He doesn't have anything to do interviews. You can just type. So I think Hunden could have had that career actually, but he's so stupid that I think he just panicked with all this stuff that's going on now especially knowing he's going to get this longer ban and added to that knowing that his org sort of fucked him and I don't think the Astralis deal was ever there in light of their history but maybe he believed it was and that's been taken from him now I think he overreacted I don't think he thought it through that actually essentially the long-term play was sort of don't implicate everyone and then you might actually be able to be hiding in the industry. Because there's the thing to think about now. Not only has he got the worst black mark ever, so now we even find it out he works with an org would make people think they're pieces of shit. But even worse, now no one can believe you. You have zero integrity left. You have nothing left. And this is the part he's really fucked up. Pro players do this as well. When you tell all the fucking tales and point all the fingers on your way out, you might think that I, as another org, am going to go, well, good, fuck that rival org. No, what I think as your future employer is... Well, he'll just do that to me if things go bad. If things go sour, he's just going to fuck me and every one of our players. So now I can never hire you, no matter who you are. So I do think it's one of the stupidest players of all time. Like, forget even just the cheating element, like just the way he's handled everything in the wake of it. Matt or Zen, do you have any take on this? Do you want to jump in? I mean, mine is just why did it for me? It seems relatively obvious that it's when they sued him or something. I mean, I don't yes. know what suing means, but yeah, it, well, exactly. it, it could be very bad. Like maybe in his position, it's like, well, I'm fucked. And we had agreed. And I, I don't know, I think you tweeted something about someone agrees that he took a fall for the org. Like, he took the bullet initially. Yes. Uh, and so now they're suing me? I mean, one thing is, fuck you, go away. The other thing is suing you in real life. Sure. It could be really complicated. It's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, heroic is suing me, so let's make sure there's no heroic, and let's fuck them. Uh, oh, the other it, thing, quickly to mention as well, by the way, is there was uh, two other details I forgot. One is obviously they also burned him with not taking him to, to Cologne, which he obviously wanted to go to the LAN and all that jazz. I hope this guy will rejoin in a second. And then the other thing was, um, oh, fuck, let me think, what was it? There was one other detail. Let me think, what the fuck was so it? Doing the, he took the fall for it. Oh, no, I know the other detail. It was intimated in the article Richard just published, I believe, that like... Um, Heroic maybe is behind on paying out prize money as well. So I wonder if that's part of it as well, mate. Like, they're not just suing him, but because they're suing him, they claim, like, we're not going to give you all this prize money and salary that we owe you or something. If that's part of it as well, then, like, 
listen, I don't agree with the way he's done it, but I could also, I could sort of see why you'd think like, right, well, fuck it, then just burn everything. Like, if I'm not even going to get the money, you know, that's a, that's an extra motivator to be an arsehole, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. I, I, again, I'm not saying it's smart or that I'll do it, but he clearly doesn't have the principles or uh, clearly doesn't care anymore. So I just think it's sad. I still think he could eventually come back. It is true. Now his, his image, I mean, he's not going to get top dollar. He might get, like you say, a, a position where he's invisible sometime down the line because his skills are still, there's probably no one else that has his skills oh, in the sure. entire scene. So someone will play for it. There's loads of dodgy people. I mean, it's esports. It's not like yes, um, but it is. I mean, yeah. It's it's a shame that he basically, like a year before, he would. Okay, at least for people who knew insiders, he was a god, and now like oh, everyone sure. hates him. It's 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 really really big downfall. I mean, if you want to talk about alternate histories, I've told this story before. Not only. When I knew he was going to leave as in-game leader of Mad Lions, did I tell almost every Flashpoint org, hire this guy if you're a European team and you want to get talent? Like It's literally just a pipeline. But secondly, I've told this story in the past. It's just a lot of people won't be aware of it. In 2017, before Cloud9 got Tarek and uh, Rush... When they were, they were actually, they had a period in the spring where they sort of slumped. And I basically had Jack pretty much convinced to get Valde and Hunden. Valde at the time was an up and coming star. And Hunden, I said, right, what you do is you bring him in just to be an IGL initially. And then if you don't like him, because he's obviously not very good individually, you just set up the structure of the team, take him out of the team, and then have him be a talent pipeline for Danish players, including obviously they've got a million game leaders. So I actually, at the time, that was going to happen even, by the way. Jack was even on board with this. The problem is, some of the players in the team who I can't name were just dickheads and refused to let European players join. So they sort of sabotaged the move and it never happened. So yeah, there's many ways this guy could have had a fa fabulous career. And I do think his skill set is mega unique. Like I've never seen anyone who's found that much talent. In fact, some of the people we even sort of give credit for training people up because they did take people from tier two to tier one. A lot of people don't know. They all basically just took the baton from Hunden. It's like Hunden brought the players and then the difference is then Snappy and MSL and uh, or Glaive, old school players, different people. Then they would take that guy, a silly in Barry, they would take a Hunden player and then the idea is, you know, he's sort of like half set it up for you and then you just take him to the next level. So that, I actually think the Danish scene itself will suffer from this. I mean, obviously they're not they're not in the worst spot now, but it's what the next crop of players is, you know. Like you need people to do that. Do you have any take on this, Matt? Uh, not so much on the hunt and stuff. I just think with like all the stuff and the cheating and issues we have, I just think people should probably just uh, disavow him and just try to get the scene back to better stuff. Let's switch topics then. Do you want to talk? You want to talk about Matt? Uh, I guess on the like Counter Strike economy, you've talked a bit about a long time ago about running five riflers to the op. Okay, is that still like a possibility? And or do you need really, really, really good riflers to even have that possible possibility? I mean, the thing with that for me is obviously, yeah, if you have the personnel, like if you have incredible riflers, I mean, listen, it, like. In theory, if I had a team that was like Electronic, Nico, and Magisk, I, I don't probably need an AWP in that team. Like, I actually would be an unbelievable team. I've got all elements of the round covered in that scenario. The problem mainly is the AWP also brings like different benefits that are sort of hidden. They don't show up on the scoreboard. Like, for example, you can obviously leave an AWP on his own and he can play super far back in a site and watch an angle. So it allows you to rotate people off. Classic use of the AWP is you just use it to set, like, split the map in half, like you cover middle on some area, and then the idea is they have to cross in front of that line of sight of the AWPer, therefore he has, like, not map control, but he has information control over where they can be in a way that a rifler doesn't always have, you know. Uh, obviously, if you're a good CT AWPer, it costs utility to get you out of position and just take areas of the map. So there are sort of, like, secondary and third effects of having an AWP that will always make it valuable. But I personally do think it is overrated. Like for me, the obvious example is teams like G2. In G2, a player like Amanek on the AWP, because he's just not a, a star AWPer, he can only take you so far. 
So, like, if you're playing against, like, the 10th best team in the world, yeah, he's probably going to be all right. It's not going to be a problem. It's not going to be a liability. But whenever you play against the elite orpers, it means he can either never take, like, aggressive orp angles because he's just going to get his shit eaten up by all, like, Device, Cebu, you know, all the elite orpers. Or it means that he does take those angles and you just get a ridiculous differential because the problem with the orp being one shot, one kill is... If two orpers go head to head, the one that dies didn't do damage to the other guy. That's what makes it different from a rifle. So it means that when you do get dominated, orper versus orper, in that scenario, you're just a massive liability. And then you throw in as well. You have to save all the orps. It costs so much fucking money. So to me, I actually think a lot of teams could run five rifles. And I'm surprised sometimes they don't, especially on the CT side, because the CT side economy is so difficult to maintain. I don't want to save as much. And and plus, think about how cheap the M4A1S is now, $2,900. Like, I think a lot of teams should try on certain maps, obvious examples, stuff like Nuke. You should just try five rifles. I think that it would be a lot cheaper. You'll get more gun rounds out of it. Does anyone else have a take on this? Because obviously, this is one of those ones where, like, because most of the elite teams have a super duper orper, they all just tell you you have to have an orper, you know, like, but they don't realize they have device or they have fucking old school guardian or Kenny S or something, you know. Anyone else have a take on this? What about you, Zen? I mean, I just, the thing about the idea of not always playing with that orper and leaving it to the players to think about it is that the players are also so stupid about like economy decisions, like, yes. minute by minute, that I would not delegate to them. Maybe if I create a system where it's like, Okay, we have like Zayu or something, usually plays the op, but you know, if we think we don't need it a bunch of rounds, someone in these conditions, we don't buy it. I think that could work. Otherwise, I think it has to be the, the coach or something thinking about it because I wouldn't delegate, I wouldn't trust the players for that. Um, and yeah, the, the first things you said about the utility of the op, I still think uh, when I used to play FPS, I, I would play like op or sniper, and I think the value is just one shot kill. It's too strong um, to give it up. I also think as well, like another problem is people have just made ARPA a fucking role, which doesn't, like I'm saying, if you want to be in the top 10 in the world and actually have a chance to win tournaments, at that point, how good your ARPA is probably determines if you're going to have that chance or not. So as I'm saying, if you have the 11th best ARPA, yeah, good luck beating all the top four teams, mate. Like it's just not not going to happen for you, which is so rare that you're going to dominate them. So another issue I think you have to bring up for me is I think not only have they made it a role, so whoever in their team is the ARPA just is the ARPA all the time, but teams also, they don't understand the value of sometimes doing it by committee. Like, an obvious team to me, I think that overused the AWP was Team Liquid, the classic 2019 lineup, even the one that won all those tournaments. Because Nitro wasn't that good an AWP, he was very streaky. So it meant that on the maps, like, if he had a game of overpass on CT side and he just shit the bed with the AWP, like he did at the Major, well, then you just get nothing out of that. You get absolutely nothing out of that position. Meanwhile, if you think about that team that they had... Like, we know NAF ops, so you, what you do is you just ask him, what map do you want to op on? Right, okay, maybe I want to op CT side Inferno. Maybe I'm going to play the B bomb site or something. Okay, you can op that map. Then maybe, I don't know, I know Twists at one point in time wanted to op. Maybe he ops T side Mirage or something. like. You can also do it by committee like that, you know. Tell someone to just specialise on that one map or just do it when you're feeling it as well. I mean, a lot of players still pick it. Like, I have to say, actually, he's, he's got a way better handle on it now, but I don't like Nico as a primary opper, but I do like it when he feels like he's feeling it from a certain position and he wants to just give the opponent a different look if he buys it two or three rounds he can be very impactful and he can go straight back to the rifle so it's also not the case that you know it's like all we have we have an opera or we have no opera i think there's a middle ground and then also look at the map pool like it depends what maps you're playing like if your entire game is like like i say like playing around Anto inferno maybe vertigo there's certainly maps out there, maybe even ancient. There's certainly maps out there you don't have to play with an AWP. Yeah, you're going to have a hard time on, like, Dust 2, Overpass, if Train still existed. Like, these maps, just, like, the element of the layout of the maps in the bomb site means a super long-range AWP will always have some impact, I think. Is there anything else on this topic, or do you want to switch to another one? Yeah, I had a quick question. That, like, when we've, like, suggested roster changes before, it's All right. been about... Like you need to swap for a better op or a good op, but the supply of op, like super good op, obviously isn't there. So yes. if there's not even like, are there new operas and what's the pipeline for that? And how did they, how do you yeah. people become sure. super good operas? Right. The main problem is this. Another thing about the op that is, makes it a nightmare for pro player 
is it is the ultimate gun that you're going to shit your pants with on LAN if you're not a really experienced LAN player who's gotten over the jitters. Like, you, like I know it sounds mad because in theory it's just one shot, one kill, but it's also the gun where I, I always give this analogy. Think about the CT economy now. Imagine you start off and initially your team's down a few rounds and you finally hit the money to buy your AWP and armor. You know, if you lose that AWP and you don't do any kills, you're right back in the toilet and now your team's lost half of the first part of the game like the first half you might be like down 2 to 11 or something so unfortunately the pressure is going to be enormous when you play on land so part of the problem I feel like at the moment with picking up AWPers is there are actually tons of people in tier 2 that you've never heard of who supposedly are like magical AWPers like they just they just wreck people all day basically they do what Poison used to do if people know when he was in like I don't know the 25th best team in the world but he was always putting up great stats now you've seen in Call he's very much more streaky but that's the sort of player that in theory you can pick up but again you in theory when you bring in an op he's going to be a star of your team so you're also saying when you pick him up i don't just want what he's got now but he can also go to the next level so i feel as though the fact we haven't had many lands is also what makes people hesitant because we haven't really been able to crown the next crop you know yeah we've gotten brokey and we've gotten mantu because they sort of slipped under the under the fucking curtain in terms of playing on land maybe you could say a call though he's kind of played like shit in mouse spots but the problem is all the other people i've heard of like supposedly in Mad Lions, they have a whole bunch of players who are up, like War or 2K and a few other people. I know there's uh, like there's a load of players who just play in FPL who are from, like, you know, this guy's from Poland, this guy's from fucking Bulgaria, this guy's from fuck knows where, Ukraine or something. Supposedly there are tons of people out there. Obviously, Russia had a whole bunch of them. But again, like I said, they haven't been in top teams and they haven't played enough land that I think people want to, like, gamble their whole future on them. That's why, to me... I actually don't look at this lucky pickup from Astralis and go, wow, he's the future. I go like, that shows nobody was willing to join Astralis for the last six months. Like I've been reporting on by the numbers. So even though I do think apparently Config will go there, in terms of AWPers, yeah. Like I feel like that's one where they've actually taken a guy from way too low level. Like I'd feel like he'd need at least a year before he'd be competent if he indeed has the skills. He looks okay in some of the games I've seen. So basically, yes, there are there is the pipeline of AWPers out there. I just feel as though the tier one is another problem we have. I'm, I always say the problem is that, like the GMs don't know any of the players because they don't. Half of them go off like Reddit narratives and history, you know. That's why they're willing to sign some bum ass old player. But even worse, a lot of the play of the tier one players, think about how much they play and practice now. Like, unless you're an FPL and you're impressing them, they're not gonna know you exist, mate. Like, if you're just playing in like Snow Sweet Snow Cop. The, the top, I'm sorry, like someone who plays in like Fnatic probably doesn't know you are, mate, unless they play you directly. So there is also a big problem. It's been a problem in CSGO for a long time, actually. We don't really have the proper grassroots to pro progression because in games at 1.6, I've often told this story. If you were in countries like, I mean, almost every major country in Europe, basically, there was always a land scene as well. And there would be also like a, a national qualifier to a big major type tournament. And so there was always a place where a pro player would eventually get to see a semi pro who's really good. And then if not then, in the future, they might say, right, well, maybe he's the next guy. I've actually played against him. He's legit or he beat me in this qualifier. That doesn't really exist now. Like I know there's online qualifiers, but you've seen how insane the like um, parity is in those. So unfortunately with those ones, if anything, that makes it harder to identify who's good because seemingly anyone can scourge a random victory over like a 20th best team. So you don't really know. Is that just where they play like shit? Is it online? Is that guy actually good? So I know there's a few players out there that people people rate and people say are up there, but I don't get the feeling that there's the same hype among the pros, unfortunately. Anyone have anything on that? Are we switching? Uh, I have some thoughts just on the yes, do it. Yeah, like the op system. It almost reads to me like, uh, let's say for a team system in general, if a couple of years ago you look at a team like Astralis and you think, ah, that's like the hypothetical best way to play Counter-Strike. So we just need to have the Astralis system with all of our calling and setups and everything. But there's a whole bunch of steps along the way that, that are so contingent on the parts you have, the parts versus the parts they have and things like that. So it almost reads where Team C like, oh, the hypothetical best way to play Counter-Strike is to have a good opper. So time for us to pick an opper, even when they don't exactly have the parts. Yes. Or so they're not really seeing, you know, they're seeing the positives of getting an opper, but they're not seeing the positives of not having an opper. And I think to to Matt's point where like, how do you even get a good opera and kind of like the thought of operas now, it's almost even a um, when teams do go this route and pick someone to be the opera, it's kind of cursed whatever happens because I like the idea of someone getting it two or three rounds in a, in a map, 
But the problem is they're never like really practicing it, right? They're never really getting their feet off the ground and getting the ball rolling. But then if they go all the way in, like someone like Amanek, then, you know, they can only get so far. Then suddenly they're, they're hitting the ceiling and the ceiling's way too low. So it almost reads to me like those kinds of players who say, yeah, I'm going to try being an IGL for, you know, a couple yes, months, see exactly. how it goes. So I, I really uh, dislike seeing the same thing with ops. And I want to see more teams, like you mentioned, Team Liquid, where let's just leave the op and play a different style, play to a style that plays to our strengths with the players that we have. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's sad to hear because obviously like, you want to see smart players. You want to believe that, you know, it's like the NFL and they fucking game plan properly and they have like film that they've... They do some of that, but unfortunately, when it comes to like larger strategic concepts, like the meta of how we set up a team and how we recruit... In esports, this applies to all esports, but CSGO in particular, there's just a lot of like copying whoever the best is. So as you say, in many ways, Astralis sort of fucked the rest of the scene. Like my joke would be, I actually think, aside from a few roster moves that happened, I actually think part of what made Astralis so dominant is that teams that didn't have the personnel to even vaguely copy what they were doing just tried to copy them and as a result were like half as good as Astralis. Like the famous example, if people don't know, was in 2018, when they still had Taco in Team Liquid, because Zeus does like tactical play, he was basically using some of the things and some of the style that Astralis used, and it was letting him dominate a lot of teams. Like Famously, they used to beat Na'Vi every time. They could beat, Fa they could beat everyone except Astralis. The problem was, when they then went head-to-head -head with Astralis and played Astralis on Inferno and Nuke, you were just playing right into Astralis' hands and then you wonder why you never won a single fucking time with that lineup. Like, it sort of makes sense, you know? That's like trying to play fucking defensive counter-puncher against Floyd Mayweather. It's like, mate, that's his shit. That's his wheelhouse. You know, you've got to come with something different there. So I do think that, unfortunately, and when you think of, like, the meta of how people make their team and play the game... A lot of people aren't trying to innovate the meta. What they're trying to do is catch up in their mind. But I don't believe there is such a thing as catching up. I think what you do is you assess your pieces, your fundamentals, and then you build according to that style. It's why I know you don't follow League of Legends, but in League of Legends, I've actually been fairly successful the last few years pushing back against the idea that you just look at the best team and copy how they play. I believe it's more about, you know, you find the best style for you and your players. And if that's not a good style overall, you probably need different personnel. Anyone so you, got another topic? Or do you want to keep going there? Yeah, I just said, do you think that it's like salvageable for G2 to take this mentality or is it just not the personnel there to like take Amanek off the off? I think in their team, they don't even need the AWP, mate. Like, Amanek's not even that good an AWP. He's all right, but he doesn't even attempt to really play like an aggressive AWP. That's why they themselves even do that fucking skadoodle cloud nine. Egg. Like, he's sort of a support AWP. -er. It's like, well, that doesn't even make sense that the support player would have the most expensive gun, mate. But all right, yeah, if you say so. I mean, why are you ever saving it then if he's just going to use it supportively? So to me, a lot doesn't add up about that. And I feel as though the good thing about G2 is I feel like it's like Malek had a bunch of Lego pieces, but none of it's from a kit. And he's just made something cool out of what he had. But it's, in my opinion, I mean, I made this video like, what, two, three months ago now? I think they capped that team out. And I think also they got lucky that the top 10 was pretty fucking weak when they were rolling. So I think they have to make a change. And so that's one of the reasons why, for example, if they were one of the teams that plumped down and bought like Rops, for example, I don't think you need to have an AWP in that team. If you had Nico, next, uh, Nico Hunter and Rops and they could all somehow coexist... You're going to do insane damage with those players. Like, I don't think you have to have a bad AWPer to go along with them at that point in time. I hope he just gets better. So, yeah, I think if a team's good enough, I think G2 is a good example, you can survive without one. Now, you're going to have to rethink the game, of course, but I don't, I don't personally think it would be the hit that other people do. I mean, if people don't know, there definitely were teams earlier in the game who didn't really need an AWP. You know, like there's times that Virtus Pro and an IP played fairly limited with the AWP, but they were still amazing teams, had incredible teamwork, knew exactly the maps to play on, had their style. So I think it's doable. Are we switching up? Zen, what about you? Have you got a topic, mate? Yeah, I want to talk a bit about Fnatic. I know you have Karn on and he kind of, his position is, okay, let's, we, we want to be at the top, etc. I mean, the team looks okay, I guess, but I don't see them aiming for the top. Um, obviously, they don't have infinite money, which makes it harder. Uh, but wh where do you see them? What do you think is the potential of the team right now? They, they've played a bit with Alex. I mean, it's not like amazing. It's not bad, but um, yeah, I, I don't see an obvious way out unless like it just screams and a bunch of people start playing much better. 
Right, the main problem I see with their team is one, they obviously have a bunch of land players, like Crims, Alex, and Brolan are all land players. Like if you go to land again, that call's gonna do some work. My issue is I have two main issues with Fnatic at the moment. One is this whole angle, and I even saw from Richard's interview with Alex that Alex really is espousing this. Right? Even though I think Messi is sort of like the fucking UK Zipniks, they genuinely believe he can play any role and that he is as talented as Brolan. And so as a result, if you watch them play, they're sometimes giving Messi seemingly the resources, not Brolan. Whereas to me, it's like, look, the one thing Brolan has is mad mechanics, mate. Like, he's still a young player. You've got to put him in a star role and sort of mould the team around him. So I don't think they use the firepower correctly at the moment. And then the other thing is, I think this is where, obviously, they're experimenting now with Alex and Messi in this non-Swedish lineup. But they've still got a hangover from when they had the Swedish lineup, which is, that's why they had to have Giacchino, because he is Swedish. Well, if we're doing English and we got Alex anyway, just fuck. Tell Giacchino, thanks, it's been real. You can go and play in some shit team now. And then just get any of these AWPers that we've just been talking about. Get fucking War Roll 2K. Get Smooya. Get any anyone, basically, who looks like they have the skills now. And then give them to Alex. I mean, you just look at what Alex did with Zewu. So I would say I think they need a better AWPer. That's an obvious example of a team that should just take almost anyone that's good. And again, the fact that they've gone international, I don't think they've fully comprehended mentally. Like, well, yeah, we could have anyone now, mate, as long as they speak English. Yeah, even uh, one of the others, like just to test, like uh, Guardian or Kenny S or something like that. Just to, yeah, if they want to play against Oscar, again. yeah. Um, I think any of those could be a, a nice. I do think one thing that's very weird is bearing in mind at the moment, it looks like lands are going to be like, you know, let's say like an average of one every three months. If people don't know, it wasn't that Oscar is literally like, I don't ever want to go to land. Like, when he played in mouse spots, he only declined something like two lands. He declined, like, ESL Belo Horizonte. By the way, I wouldn't want to go to fucking Brazil either. And then I think there was, like, one other tournament that, you know, he said, like, let's not go, and then the whole team didn't go or whatever. Now, he also maybe doesn't want to do as many boot camps. All I would say is this. We're not even in the fucking LAN era like that. Like, we're, now we're on this, like, online circuit with occasional boot camps, and then and then it's sort of like a hybrid LAN circuit where you can have a few LANs. And by the way, unless you're in the top 10, you might even fucking get invited to those LANs, or you might not qualify. So I actually think right now is the perfect time to take Oscar back. Like, he's obviously banging. He's really skilled. I, I think in a team like, like Fnatic, potentially... Look, you don't know where the next year is. Like, you might change the lineup in one year anyway. So, I do think people like him are obviously worth a chance, you know. Smooya, obviously, you have to handle his attitude. Like, I don't necessarily buy that he's just turned his whole fucking personality around because he apologised to Richard Lewis. Like, that ain't enough for me, man. I've got to actually see see that manifest, you know. There is a reason they kick you out of every team. So, I would just say that the reason why I like the Oscar one is, look how long he's been grinding now. He's proven that he's actually going to be good. People like Kenny S and Guardian, I mean, Kenny S is sort of waiting for Lance to come back, and then Guardian's tried a bit, but it's been up and down results, so they're more of a gamble, I think. Yeah, would you take one of these? Go ahead. Well, so would you take one of these, like, T2 oppers and throw them in there, or do you think Giacchino's better than that option? I don't really know who actually thinks Giacchino's good. Have I missed something? Like, here's the difference. People at least had a bit of hype around, like, knock. Um, you know, some of those sorts of players. Uh, I haven't even heard any... Whoever said Giacchino's good? Has anyone ever said it? Has any top pro ever gone, wow, I think he's really good at... Wow, he's got all his potential. Like, as far as I know, people are just... Like I said, people were just like, well, he's Swedish. See, see if this works out in Fnatic. Like, that's about that's about the take, in it? So I don't get it. I don't know what he's doing in that team. I mean, if you want me to give a cynical suggestion, maybe because he's nobody, he's on a really cheap contract... And as Zen alluded to, Fnatic don't really want to spend loads of money necessarily, unfortunately. And that since they've lost that golden generation core, even though they were spending big money on some of those guys for salary, I also think that's maybe why they cut those guys. There's another angle, unfortunately, in the online era. Certain teams also want to go for the young player because I might just have to pay him like 6k a month while I pay you know my star player like 28k a month. They're just thinking... I save 20k, and if I can get even half the results, maybe somehow that works, you know. I don't really know it myself, if that makes sense. I personally, if you're in Counter-Strike, you're in Counter-Strike. Get your fucking checkbook out. If you're not, then fuck off to Rocket League or Rainbow Six or Call of Duty or whatever you're into, you know. 
<laughs> I see it sort of that same way where looking at players like Crims and Berlin who have played under like the Fnatic system with the Fnatic players and with Golden, especially for Berlin being so new, you know, it's kind of a lot of what they know. So is the idea to go all in on a new international roster and like totally redo the new Fnatic way? Well, if that was the case, then yeah, we wouldn't have grabbed Jaquinho. There's so many other names that are not Swedish. So are we trying to stay core to Swedish and, you know, kind of ride out this kind of middle upper area and Counter-Strike just to stay relevant. But I don't know. Someone like Alex is such a big signing that it seems like they're not content to just stay, uh, you know, alive as an org. Yeah, another thing is, like, I don't hate the idea. In fact, it's usually how I would do a team. I do think it's fine to bring the in-game leader in and say, right, these are the pieces I've got now. Just see what you can do with them. Because obviously, like, the classic examples are people like Carrigan. Someone like Carrigan might maybe suddenly turns that player into, like, one and a half times better player and sort of figure out, oh, he's in the wrong role or someone wasn't using him or needs to be more aggressive. And then suddenly... Right, now he's reclaimed, he's good. So I don't mind sort of giving like, you know, two or three months and then you say to the IGL, like, look, does this guy stay or go? What's your vote? That's also fine. So I suspect they will do that with Chiquino eventually. They'll just replace him. That's not terrible. It's just that like, you certainly hope this isn't like the fucking NIP project where as far as I can tell, if you t- like... Joke is, if you were to ask Nip, but how does LNZ become a top pro? They would just pull out like rosary beads. They'd fucking start smudging in the air. They'd fucking pray to the ancestors at a Shinto track. Like, like, what are you? There's no fucking tech. There's no technique. There's no path for him to become a top player. Like, mate, he's already been coached by threat for months and months and months. He's already playing with device. Like, at this point in time, like, what are you? What are you? What's gonna? What, how's lightning gonna strike and make this guy three times better? It's probably not, is it? So at this point, they're just fucking riding a lame mule as it were like they've got to they've got to shit or get off the pot Is it Alex? Give them more options to um like even if they say alex will let you choose a direction of the team from here on i almost uh yeah i'm taking a look into the crystal ball myself here and i really am seeing a kind of future where you know they have some middling results they get a good upset against a top five team but then at the major they don't make it out of the group stage into the you know into the playoffs so i don't know i feel like if they wanted to really get the ball rolling, they could now, but it just kind of feels like another one of those. We're like, cool, we're going to really do nothing for like four or five or six months. And by the time we want to go all in on our in-game leaders vision of, well, whoops, we haven't really been getting the results to really feel like we should believe in this guy. So it's almost one of those things where it feels a little bit doomed to fail, even though I could see them going that route. Sure. How long has Alex and Mezzi been in Fnatic by now? I mean, I'm going to say what, like a month, month and a half or something. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's a big enough move that you think Fnatic would change another player if they're not getting results, right? I think. I'd certainly hope so, especially because, you know, I mean, again, you don't always know how other people see them, but to me, yeah, that is a big... Oh, he's apparently been in since the beginning of August, but obviously there was the plague rake. Uh Yeah, I mean, to me, that, like, like, like uh, Matt said, if you're going to sign a player like that, uh, I'm sorry, Zach, just go ahead and fucking go all out. Like, you've got the IGL, okay, so I assume you still think Brolan's a young talent. Crims is at a minimum a great veteran. I think I actually feel like he still has more game in him. He's one of the most consistent players of all time. Basically, realistically, assuming Messi does his job, aren't we just one player away? The trouble is, if that player has to be a star, yeah, Fnatic's probably not going to buy him. So again, go out there and pick your FBL talent. Pick the guy that you think's going to be the next good player. Take someone who's raw and just throw him into a raw. Maybe he doesn't have to think about the like entry frag or something. I don't know. Yeah, and if they do well, even if they are at the major, they'll sell bazillions of stickers. Uh, so I think oh, sure. they have a high incentive to at least try to get in, you know, in a proper way. Yeah, by the way, another thing about organizations is cause organizations, like the people who run the org and then the fucking GM and the G- CGO and all that garbage, cause they tend to actually get to know the players and they have personal relationships with them. It's like those fucking TV shows where the reality talent shows, like, you know, Britain's Got Talent, American Idol, fucking The Voice. Half the reason you watch, I don't watch, but people watch it, isn't just because of how good they are singing. It's because you get attached to them personally, don't you? And you want this guy to make it and you want this guy not to make it. And you have your reasons. They get like that with players. And so probably the most annoying thing, because sometimes it pays off once in a blue moon, like fucking Cloud9 winning the Boston Major. And so these guys get to believe like, see, my fifth was rewarded. 
they they also think of it sometimes when they have a shit lineup, like a lottery. Like they think, well, you never know, you know, maybe they go to the major and, you know, they just get the nice draw and then the guys get confident and then this guy overperforms a bit. And next thing, you know, we're in the legends position. And because, like I say, it's happened the odd time. People have made the miracle run. Sometimes all is also just like, it's almost like you just want to be, I want to at least be part of the event, even though to me, again, it's like, I, I think of it kind of like sports gemming. I either know this team can't win and I've got to blow it up and risk even that it's terrible for a while, or I know it's on the brick of being good. And then I just, you know, I say, right, this is the year I spend my big money and I go all out and I get the big name I need. And then now let's see, can we stack the trophies, you know? Maybe another element I should throw in as well to consider is since a lot of esports org works off, work off venture capital money and raising money every few years, there's also some that if they're in a spot now where they spent all their money on a different game or they don't know that they can get the top player now so they don't want to spend the money, some of them also might just be surviving for this year and then maybe next year they put the money in, you know, like there's also that. There's a there's sort of like an, a, a bigger concept that sometimes affects how much teams are willing to do. Hence why teams like Envy have loads of money in esports, but just didn't spend any on CS. Meanwhile, you have teams, surprisingly, like G2, who were almost a joke when they had that semi-French lineup for a while last year, but then they spent the big money and got Nico and kind of went for it, you know. I have an abstract one, which is the... the now that Major is coming, maybe it will go back to normal. But it's just the fact that we still use Majors um, to basically say how good a team is. Sure. And there hasn't been one in so long that maybe half the people viewing but don't even like know yeah, what a true. major is. It's two mean, years obviously ago. they know what it is, but they, they they all know that it's completely different um environment and pressure and, and how people sure. remember it. Um so you think it's still appropriate to, to have the majors as, as the main thing we're counting basically? Well not the main, but you know, the, the one that gets the most points. Um or do you think we should get something else uh like I don't know. I know HL to be rating is not good, but basically something like that that would actually track. Okay, this is how much you're winning, so you're you were the best team this year or something. I would say yes and no. Like yes, in the sense that I mean, we're all just so desperate to watch land play at this point in time. We will accept almost anything. I mean, we all pretended that even though Cologne was just them in a fucking empty room, like oh, land's yeah. back, it's land again, baby. Like, is it? Yeah, is minutes. it, mate? Like, you know, I can go to a fucking local land with more pressure. Than some like at least five kids might be stood behind me watching me play. So, like, you know, some of that was oversold. So, yes, on the one hand, majors are still going to be massively important. Obviously, it'd be the event of the year. It would be everything about Counter Strike would sort of center on that point. But the way the reason why I sort of agree with you that like they don't really hold the same status it's just because we haven't played enough fucking lands like people even the good people like i for me at cologne wasn't like lan is back it was like there are certain skills that only exist on lan that you can just sort of see more emphasized so to me i look at those two busted ass teams that made the semis phase clan with carrigan and astralis with glaive and i just say that just shows how great and a good igl is at reading teams on lan that doesn't actually show that those were good teams as you see when they go back online so if anything i think everyone's going to be this is the depressing thing i said a few months back i think everyone's going to be in like semi shitty lan form because people haven't got the rhythm down of it you know you got to play a few i would say it's good. As a result, it shouldn't really define your career. Like, for example, if Zewu and Simple don't win this major, it's not really the same as back when we had two majors a year and all the lands, and you know, you could have peaked for that major. It's more roll of the dice that when they get there, are they playing really great land form? Or is one of them just unfortunately going to take four days to get into shape and maybe by then it's too late? So I think to some degree, we probably shouldn't put the same spotlight on it. It's just. It's almost a necessity because we're all just desperate that the scene can't just be a million online tournaments every weekend, you know? I'm excited to see the uh, the kind of state of the scene afterwards as well. Like you're saying, they want to just be a part of the major and things like that, where for the whole online era, basically, even before it, the kind of one thing tying everyone together was like, well, we just got to make it to the major. We just need our RMR points. We just need a team yes. good enough. And I'm uh, you know, a little bit afraid, right? After living in limbo in so long, are we going to go to, to heaven or hell out of this purgatory with the, the finances of the industry and, and you know the state of these different teams? My hope, my my real hope for the major, like I can't really say it has to be at the best level players, but like I, again, I can't really know that that stuff happened. So my main hope for the major, 
is that basically it acts as a reset because remember another reason you don't want to change players all the time is because you're playing a million RMRs and every time you change a bloody player you lose some of your points from the RMR so it's like you're actually like hurting your own chances of qualifying for the major unless it's just a way better player so I think another thing is because that'll all be reset and because we'll have had the big event and now there's not really an excuse if you're a team who's like ninth to just sit there unless you were a team that, you know, overperformed to get the ninth, assuming you have aspirations to win. Now you've got to spend money. Like after the major, I think a lot of checkbooks open. I think people like G2, um, FaZe Clan, who else maybe would be in the mix for this? I mean, I've heard rumours, maybe some some of the Flashpoint orgs come back and maybe it's not impossible. Cloud9 comes back in the scene. I can't remember if they said Envy was possible. Maybe not after the recent shit. Who the fuck knows? But yeah, I think I think the bigger orgs, the majors sort of like what, what they've been leading to. And that will decide either do they just not really give a fuck about CS or is it time to spend? Is it time to, to show that like, right, let's go. With the major being on LAN and if it goes well, do we, we're going to see like much more LAN events being played and stuff or you still think the Corona stuff... The problem is this, right? There's a secret element hiding behind all this that you'll never hear the TOs admit, which is they love having online events. You've seen that the ES charts, like the viewership went up during the online period. So think about that. They're getting more viewership, yes, on an inferior product, but what do they fucking care? People are like, yes, I don't care. They brought the product, mate. Generally, you know, they're just about trying to get the most hits and get the most sponsorship money and get and survive. So the idea that they get to have more hits with lower costs. Because if people don't know, especially the big flagship events like Katowice, Cologne, you typically lose money running those events. They're basically like lost leaders. You run them because they're the pinnacle of your circuit and they've got prestige and that's, you know, that's going to be the biggest viewership. But generally, you lose money. You lose money running majors. So as a result, I think actually that these fuckers like ESL, that already, if you know, their parent companies were sort of on the brink of trying to sell them because they cost too much money. I think these orgs, they low-key love that we're in a fucking scenario where you can't have a LAN every month and there aren't going to be loads of smaller LANs as well. They like the idea of a hybrid circuit where it's like, right, every three months I have my Cadavice, I have my Cologne, a major comes along. And then the rest of the time we go online, which by the way, you hire less talent for that. You don't have to fly them to a studio always depending on what cir- what circuit you're on. Sometimes you can do it online. Um some of them probably even take a lower rate because there's less talent being hired. Therefore, they want to secure their jobs. There's a bunch of like economic factors that basically mean, even though technically, technically we could right now, no joke, host most tournaments on LAN. Yes, you'd have to, with certain countries, you know, give a bit of leeway for the quarantine and all that. But there's some countries, like obviously Sweden now, you don't have to do any of that shit. If you don't have the visas, you can go. So in theory, actually, we could already have returned to land. Obviously, we're not going to bring into this conversation any elements of like, is it safe, is it not? Like, let's just leave that shit to one side. So there is a world in which, yeah, like... You'd hope the major would spark more lands, but I get the vibe it isn't going to. I get I get the vibe it's more like you'll have your Cologne and kind of eat be lands. You'll have maybe like Blast now because Denmark's through restrictions. You'll have a Blast finals be like that, but you'd have the rest online. But I think essentially for the next year or two, and again, without bringing in some external shit, if the world's still like this in two years, unfortunately, we might just be in a world where lands are the big moment that you look for every few months. Think of them like Grand Slams in tennis, but then the rest of it's online play. So that, I mean, listen, that's going to be radically different for Counter-Strike. You know, like, for example, you can't be like FaZe Clan and go, we just play on LAN. Like, you'll have to still be good online. So it, I could certainly change Counter-Strike a lot. I think I'm in a place now mentally where I can handle it. I have to say, during the like the year where it was just all online tournaments, it certainly sapped some of my interest for the game, you know? So I, I, I'm glad we've got some LANs back at least. I have a tangential topic, unless someone else had a point on this. All right, so looking at the monetization of these TOs and, and these different orgs and things like that, the conversation has been had a lot of times, like, right, how do we fix the Can economy we, yeah. of the industry in esports in general, but specifically in CSGO is a, obviously the conversation I follow. But I want to take it from a different angle because for me as a fan, I'm not exactly sure like which way I can go or what I even want. So I'll give an example with... Obviously, I like Thorin content, and then I can support directly with Patreon, and then I get something cool to have this conversation. So that's, you know, an exchange of money for something that I want and enjoy in return. But let's say I'm a big fan of Crims on Fnatic, right? What do I do then? 
do I buy like a jersey, I guess, and like have it go in my like sit in my closet or my wall, but then, you know, so much money goes to the manufacturer and to the organ things, not to Crims. Okay. Do I buy one of their products uh, from their sponsors, like, or a fanatic mouse or something, you know, that doesn't quite seem right. And it's kind of the same with TOs where obviously I want to watch these games and enjoy these games and support these games. And let's assume I'm someone who wants to pay money for it in exchange because I like the product. Right. But like, what do we really get? You know, like they're saying you can, type in twitch chat if i subscribe okay great or do i want to get some like mm, you know the different players angles while the game's going on and i mean i'm someone again i play esports and i'm an in-game leader most of the time and even that's not super interesting to me to see the players POV yes. live so where as someone who wants to contribute yeah, yeah. to this industry where could i i can figure out oh no i agree i, I always say this myself I find it ridiculous that as an industry person, look, obviously I would get it for free, but I find it ridiculous that essentially as a hardcore fan of the game, I don't have access to anything that I can pay for. Like there isn't even an option for me to fund an event I want. So I think like there's a bunch of things. Like one, I know they tried some of these things in the past. It just didn't really succeed. Like I think Face It was asking people to give donations or something. I do think like there is some sort of crowdfunding element that would be very successful. The problem with that is... Those tend to only work if you get the game dev on your side and somehow it's related to in-game items or an in-game pass or something. Like, it almost has to have, like, an official stamp before people are willing to pay. And then the other angle is, if I don't know if you know if, if this from a few years ago, but back in 2017, I was working with a company called Snipe with a Z. It was a Swedish company. still exists now. It actually created a similar product for League of Legends called ProView. And basically, the premise of this was going to be that when an event came along, like ESL Cologne, You'd have the normal broadcast, but then you'd buy the snipe pass for the event. And what it would get you was, first of all, they had this player that was way better than like a Twitch player. And it would have like every kill, every death. It would have like a timeline you could click to to go to that. You could create, like you're saying, like a viewership experience, like any POVs you want. You could look like four, five, eight, multi screens, etc. And then another element, which I was doing with them initially, was it was going to have alternate streams for the show. So for example, there was one where me, Get Right, and Semler went. And we did like Dream Act Mal more then there was IEM Katowice the one that Faze lost to Fnatic that me and Lopez went there and we went to a studio in Stockholm and basically we did a stream where we were watching the game and then we didn't talk all the time we'd let the game play out sometimes but then we would sort of just pipe up when we had a thought basically if you know in American football what they're doing with like the Peyton brothers now um, the Manning brothers where they do like their alternate Monday night football stream and it's like a mixture of stories and podcasts and then some game analysis that sometimes goes deeper than obviously the plebs on the broadcast do so I think that's another great idea because you, you're sort of making it like it's a unique experience. It's live, so it's worth paying for. Another element, obviously, would be having sort of premium content that went behind some sort of a paywall. The main problem with a lot of this stuff is that people sort of, these ideas were ahead of their time when people tried them 10, 15 years ago. And so unfortunately, again, same in the business side as pro players, I'm afraid, most people just look at the current status quo and go, how do I do what the best one's doing and try and compete with him? They don't think, right, how do I innovate? How do I how do I elevate the game? I mean, there's a famous saying that this guy Peter Thiel has, if you know who that is, where he just says, oh, don't compete with people. Go into an area where there's no one and just dominate. That's what I think. So to me, I would be trying to do these. I'd be trying to either get with Valve and make some sort of an in-game pass that funds the event, or I would make services like this where it's such a unique, really high-tech solution that maybe has a library of premium content. Like, for example, if on this Snipe thing, let's say, because I've always thought the cleverest model is to have a, something of a freemium model, I would have it where, let's say I have our higher launders, and instead of him doing his demo review shit for YouTube, where he probably gets $50 a video, I just pay him to do them for my pr premium subscription. So not only do you get the pass where you get me and throwing whoever you want, me and fucking Lurpus on a stream doing like the expert nerdcast, but you also get access to the catalog. And in the catalog, where well, you've already seen like, you know, one out of every four of those I release for free, but that's to show you what the product is. And then all of a sudden you see, what? oh, wait, he's just reviewed Simple's performance against Heroic in fucking Pro League. Oh, I've got to see that. Well, there you go. You've got your pass already, $10 a month. You've got your, the game and the stream, and then maybe that's on the side. Like, I feel as though 
I mean, just a guess on my part, but that's kind of like what you're talking about, right? That's the sort of thing I would like to pay for if it existed. Like, if I was just a fan, you know, and I didn't work in the industry, I'd love to pay $10 for that. I mean, you pay for your Netflix and all that shit. I mean, in the modern day, people will even pay for, like, some of those subscription TV channels for, like, one show that's just the big show, isn't it, in the modern day? And this is in a world where everyone in the universe could torrent it for you for free. It's just, it's more convenient, and if you earn a decent living, $10 is fucking nothing, is it? So you just think it's pay the $10 and get it in premium quality on demand, so... I feel like the tech has finally caught up. Like, we're at a point where the talent's there, the tech is there. This is the time to do it. It's just, are any of these companies actually going to do it? At the moment, no. They're just going to keep the playbook from 10 years ago and keep iterating on that, I feel like, unfortunately. Yeah, I've seen so much of the, like... Do you have a suggestion? Is there anything you would want to exist in that sense that you would pay for, do you think? Um, let me think. Yeah, I don't have anything uh, off the top of my head, but I just come at it from an angle where... I've seen a lot of the content like on by the numbers, for example, and from the TOs themselves, which is a very real issue is that a lot of esports fans don't want to pay or, or can't pay, or maybe they're really young or something, but they kind of stop the conversation there and say, well, it's hard to monetize something. Like we can't put our, our show behind a paywall because everyone's going to get really angry online. And also, I don't even think that's true though, dude. Like, here's the thing. One, Part of it is true. If you just take, because ESPN Plus did this and fucking Grantland did this, etc. If you just take a load of banging content, but it's all behind a paywall, well, the problem then is, it's a bit like, uh, here's the best analogy for you. So Joe Rogan's behind a paywall now, right? The Joe Rogan experience. I'm guessing a lot of people in this chat probably watched it, right? Did you used to watch Joe Rogan when he was on YouTube? Uh, not me, actually. Right, here's the thing. I used to watch it because it would just come up in my feed or I'd see a clip that was in the algorithm. When he went to Spotify and you have to pay, I don't have Spotify personally. So the problem is this. I still would like to watch Joe Rogan, but I'm not that eager personally to pay the $10. And worse, he just doesn't exist for me now because he's not recommended to me anymore. He's not in my subscription feed. So I just, I, also, I sort of remember every two months, oh, he does exist and do a show. Yeah, fuck, I forgot about that. But he, because it's all behind the paywall doesn't really exist for me anymore. So the problem is that, yeah, they did it too harsh before. You've got to have it, like I say, you almost use like a third or a fourth of the content released for free as a way to make people know that it exists, see how good it is, and then the people who aren't 15, the guy who's like 25 and has a job, is going to go, well, I want the other three episodes of this, so he's just going to pay for the thing. He's just going to get his checkbook out, isn't he? So I think the other angle as well is think about how all the big TOs market yeah, they market right now to the 14-year-old in Twitch chat. That's why every fucking social media is like, let's get this bread. Oh, oh my God, blast. Did you know that 11-4 is the most dangerous scoreline, Zonic's Law? And they just say it every single fucking day and, every, and they spam you with it because that's like the mind of a fucking ADHD energy drink fueled fucking 14 year old Fortnite kid who's just going wow ha ha lol ratio ratio like that's that is the mentality of those morons so what they're trying to do is appeal to the lowest common denominator well that's not how you make a premium service a premium service is supposed to be the opposite end it's high end it's very good and then people who have money to pay for it pay for it and you don't worry about the ones who don't pay so an element that is really misunderstood about esports is anytime you actually do like real demographic research Dude, there are loads of people 18 to 25 who watch esports. It's just that if you tailor the whole scene to the 15-year-old, that guy's going to be a silent majority. He's just going to chill and he's going to go, well, I'm not really engaged with this bullshit. And you know what? I wouldn't pay for this stupid little kid shit. You have to make some of that's like, this is for adults, mate. This is for you. That's what you can see why I was trying to shift Flashpoint to be like that. It's just obviously they never gave me any bloody tools and we couldn't get it fully off the ground. But I was trying to go more for the adult audience. That's why I made it so we could swear. And all the dickheads who were fucking clout chasers on Twitter and HLTV podcasts were going like, huh, just wait for this to go badly. It's like, oh, by saying fuck, we're just going to mess up completely, are we? Like, I don't think so, mate. Like, what about, once you listen to about two broadcasts, you stop even worrying about it. You just go, oh yeah, adults, they can just swear because we're just on fucking Twitch, aren't we? We're not on TV. I'm not Chris Collins with having to pretend that Randy Moss fake mooning someone is the most outrageous thing ever, am I? I can just, can just live my life and be an adult, you know? This is actually for adults, believe it or not. I mean, the bloody game is Counter-Strike. It's not even Fortnite. It's, it should be for adults. It's supposed to be a thinking man's game, believe it or not. I know it isn't because it's just HLTV going, insert whoever lost, laugh thread. You fucking suck. Like, but that's just 14 year olds, you know? At the moment, people essentially think how what an indictment it is of the market and people in esports that they can only sell to 14 year olds. They can't sell to you and me, who, like we say, are like that meme, like, please let me give you my money. 
Yeah, I think the best example was in Korea OGN uh, a few years ago in League of Legends. Yes, you would pay definitely. like X a month. And you, you, I mean, if you watch live, you still get to see everything, but you then get the VODs basically for the, yes. and I think better quality if you're watching live. Yes. And for that, they were getting basically millions. Yeah, but then Megamarks. Riot came in and, and, and destroyed it. But yeah, basically you're, you're at the mercy of the developer. And Valve, they have the international, they have the, that shitty companion that gets millions that they get like half of it and they still don't want to do that for cs so sadly i'm yes. not too optimistic that it's going to come from valve even though it is simply just fucking copy it's mad isn't it <laughs> it's <laughs> mad that they don't just port that concept completely it's so insane isn't it it's like especially because oh, could we do it well could we possibly do it? especially because they still do the same model they used in 20 fucking 14 or whatever just like you've got stickers do you want a sticker and it's like mate Right, think about, I, I don't know how many of you follow European soccer, but it's pretty famous in European soccer that unless you're a mega fan, you don't really buy every season's Man United jersey because it's like a fucking pixel tweak from the last one, isn't it? Sometimes you, you even feel like a dickhead that you've bought five of them. And it's like, that looks almost identical to last season's. Why do they do that with the stickers? I don't want to buy just a Na'Vi logo with a slightly different circle around it. That doesn't even make sense, mate. Like, I've already got all the Na'Vi stickers. So you've got to make it like a better feature. And if you think about it, if people don't know, if you haven't followed Dota 2, they took the concept of this pass that you buy, initially just for TI and stuff, but eventually for other events, and they just kept expanding every year how sick it was. So initially, I think it was a mixture of just crowdfunding and then like, you know, some like a, an item in the game or a drop or something. Then they started adding stuff in, like then they added things in that were from the players. Then they added in, like a bunch of the best commentators replaced the voice lines. So instead of it being just like a character who says that, now it's like fucking, I don't know, Shiver or something like that. Well, I guess it wouldn't be yeah, Shiver. Like yeah, commentator, yeah, Cinderin or something, yeah. They say some shit in the game. That's cool, you know. Like, the idea that wouldn't bag out a control and couch. Like, I, I'll give you a free one I've just thought up off the top of my head right now. Imagine if you can buy a custom Anders or Semler voice pack. And what it does is, because no one gives a fuck about the shit that the players say in the game. Like, the you know, where they go, 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 run, little girls. Imagine that's just replaced with classic Anders lines. Like, it just goes like, are you kidding me, Shoxie? Or it just goes, you know, it's sweating bullets right now, Dupree. Like, imagine it says that instead as the random lines. Like, That'd be cool as fuck. I'd buy that dude and I'm their friend. Just to fucking hear it play out in the game or sad a case, just, just a big apple, guardian, bye-bye. Like, look, that'd be fucking sick. Who wouldn't buy that? Who wouldn't buy that? That's cool. Yeah, just hear you know? human reactions every time you win a 1v2 or something. Perfect. Like, just, exactly. <laughs> so easy. It's so easy. See, it feels like a slam dunk, doesn't it? But the other problem I will say is this. In Dota, Valve has always been fairly involved, and obviously they run TI and decide who gets hired. Whereas in CSGO, they've always been more hands-off in that regard. And so I'll say, in CSGO, I almost get the vibe more like Riot, where Riot's approach is like, listen, well, maybe once we franchise, let you have an icon in the game and someone can buy it and you get a third. That's like it. But the problem is, I actually feel like, as sad as this is, the reason why game devs like that don't say, oh, Cloud9 TSM, let's just like work on loads of stuff and merch and stuff, is because they actually want to retain more control. They don't want to live in a world where like Cloud9 becomes so huge as a fan base or something. They're like, you have to deal with Cloud9 and maybe now Cloud9 asks for more of a share. Like, some of them just don't want to give control up, believe it or not. And so being as people like Valve essentially just print money all day long with CSGO, to them, they're kind of happy with where the game is. Like, they're not the ones crying about having no Cloud9 lineup or why isn't Envy spending money or what's going on with the RMR. They're, they're kind of like winning on their end. And so they're not really motivated to do anything. It's more us in the scene that are like, look, this thing isn't going to survive at this level. Like we're going to go back in time, like five years, unless you do something or give us some tools, you know, do you want to switch topics? I have a slightly off one for the guys, but just curious on, on Bjer Bjergsen returning in league of legends. Basically he retired enough a year later, probably is coming back. Yes. Like what, what do you make of this? Is this like a proper, return of a goat or it's just more okay let's let's see how it goes but probably is not going to be significant uh, do you follow league of legends matt yeah i'm primarily league oh there we go what, what, what do you think of this move then because as he says the rumor basically is and as far as i can tell it is going to happen mate, based on things i've heard beyond the scenes apparently bjergsen comes back and believe it or not it's not the dream you know he's not going to fucking europe he's apparently he's just going to tsm again he's probably going to replace power of evil what do you think of this I don't know. I think the transfer to the coaching was 
just him and TSM. Like, I don't know if the TSM is so bad of an org. They put him back in there. I just don't think that's like a great idea for just the org. But I do think Bjergsen's a good player. I'd rather see him go back to Europe or to a different team. But he's got like TSM hooks in him. So I guess that's all we can do. Yeah, unfortunately, what people won't know about that is normally in esports, it's the other way around that the cockening begins, which is normally it's the fucking owner who's cocked by the player and just, you know, it's like fucking Castro with Nifty. It's like, I just can't quit you, Nifty. It's like, you fuck, he's garbage. Like, what are you doing this for? So you're, you're trying to create the movie of your life. But it's not a movie, so you can't write the end of like that. They asked that you'd be good at the game, you idiot. So normally it's that way around that people just can't bloody kick anyone. Like Skadoodle can't ever be kicked from Cloud9 until he literally just leaves himself because he's so shit. So bizarrely in TSM, Reginald, this is why unfortunately he's not a good guy. Because he essentially creates a toxic, asymmetrical relationship with everyone he works with. And he does that, like, pimp shit where it's like, baby, why you make me hit you? You know I love you, and I'm the only one who'd put up with you. And you just keep people sort of mentally dominated. Like, what they believe genuinely is, one, they deserve the abuse. And two, you're the only one who'll ever love them and treat them well. And everything you've done for them, I don't know if you know this, this is a real thing from toxic relationships. By treating them meaner... Then the one time on their birthday, you give them the gift they want. They over, go overboard. They're like, oh my God, this is incredible. Like, I knew you cared so much. And like, oh, this means so much to me. But like the guy who would be giving them something every month, they'd sort of be like, yeah, that, thanks. Yeah, that's good. You know, that, this, that, I don't have the same spark there in the relationship. People get like that in TSM, it seems. Because everyone who's in TSM, I get, it's not like the fanatic players who come and just fucking tell me all the stories about like Rook and Reckless. They'll tell me like the bad stuff, like, oh, Reggie was being a dickhead. But all of them on some fucked level are still like, but I'm I'm thankful that he let me in the team and what he did for me and 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 so, like, it made it's mental. Like they're all just in like Stockholm syndrome. So basically, Bjergsen is the ultimate victim of that, isn't he? Because somehow he has just mentally decided he has to be in TSM forever. There's probably also a slightly cynical element, like you know, he has the ownership stake now, where he also yeah. sees that it's getting enormous as an org and the valuation is going up, and, you know, like like part of you starts looking to your post playing career and you don't want to give any of that shit up so you'd rather be in the TSM stable but I do think this move is depressing because listen on paper I imagine he'll be better than Power of Evil I imagine he'll probably be pretty close to the level when he quit when he gets you know a few months under his belt so he'll be a good player he'll probably help TSM mix it up with Team Liquid and 100 Thieves and Cloud9 and these top teams the problem is who the fuck wants to see this rerun this is like the Star Wars movies like you're doing the same plot but just worse. So the problem I have with this move of bringing him in is, first of all, you have to radically change that lineup and make it way better if you want to compete. If you're going to keep a similar sort of TSM lineup, I just don't think you're ever going to do anything at world. So you just, it's just going to be boring in that sense. So to me, if I was Bjergsen, I even said this when he was still playing, I wanted him to just do one last year where he went to LEC and it's like, right, now I'm actually going to show everyone that being in NA, I wasn't just like, you know, boosted. And it wasn't that I was just playing shit competition. Look, I can go head to head with Caps and Humanoid and Larson and these players. And I'm actually still a world-class player. And then if he's on the right team, top three, top four team, well, in Europe, that's a, that can be playoffs at Worlds. You know, that, that can do something. You can maybe... Maybe have a chance. Also, you can stack an LEC title. You know, there's a few things you can do at this point in time. So I, I thought that would be cool. I know actually some of the people uh, in the NA scene, even behind the scenes, something they used to speculate on was of all the people who could probably handle it, why doesn't Bjergsen go and do a year in the LPL or the LCK? Believe it or not, there is like a mid-table team that would sign a player like that. These players get offers every year because essentially, I don't know if you know as much like in basketball that they do this when people are a bit washed in the NBA. They want a star from the West. Like, that's a cool storyline. Like, they would build a team around you, like Forgiven, Frog, and a bunch of these players have had the offers in the past. So I actually think it would have been also maybe cool if you just did that, you know, just be the pioneer and be the one guy to go and do a year in, like, LPL and be an enormous star there. That would be, that would be a pretty cool way to end your career as well. But what about domestically? Do you think they at least have a chance of getting back to the top or do you think it's, it's not the same as before? Where? Well, an obvious question is, who's going to coach the team? I mean, listen, the joke <laughs> is, Bjergsen was always the coach, wasn't he? He just wasn't a good coach. I don't know, by the way. This is how you know NA and Reddit is just so in love with Bjergsen, we can never have a reasonable discussion, right? If I'm the coach of a team, and I have the MVP of the split, and I finish in first place in the split, and then I finish fourth in the playoffs... 
who the fuck isn't asking for me to be fired? Like, those metrics say, at least make the final or something, you know? But because it's Bjergsen, everyone's just cool with it. Like, because it's Bjergsen, it's the player's fault. If it was Bjergsen playing, it'd be the coach's fault or the jungler's fault. Like, mate, he even supposedly picked this fucking team. I've told this story before. They could have had Jensen, Doublelift, and Licorice. Those are players they all could have had, right, in this team and obviously a different support player. They could have actually had one of the best lineups. They said no to that and went with this weird-ass scoffed lineup that doesn't even make sense. And then Reginald did that bizarre move where he sort of, like, like was like, oh, Bjergs, uh, double left, how dare you reject me? I'm just going to fuck my whole team and buy the guy for six million, but then not bring you in. And and as a result, sort of tank the team. So TSM could obviously get a lot better in terms of roster. I do think if Bjergsen's in the team, even in that team, they would probably have been at Worlds. Maybe they've had the third seed or something. My main issue is this. The Cloud9 lineup, if anything, underperformed this year, but it's pretty good on paper now that Fodge is good. And Team Liquid's lineup, I mean, remember, they never actually got a whole bloody split playing together. Like in the spring playoffs, they couldn't, they had to use the sub jungler, and Santorin only came back right towards the end of the split. So I actually think Team Liquid's lineup on paper is fucking fire still. And obviously, the world where you can even upgrade tactical, maybe. So I think that's a, that, those lineups probably are too good at the moment. I think they're probably just better than TSM's. And I hope as well, I really hope. That we've gotten past the days where just seeing TSM in the server makes you just int into them blindly and go, oh, bloody hell, I can't win. Like, I hope we're past that now. I hope people have beaten them enough, you know. Do you um, think yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. of... Keep going. I do you think a lot of the problems TSM had this split ender season was based on, like, shot calling and communication about, like, what to do what and when to do how? So I'm pretty sure if Bjergsen's in there, I'm pretty sure they finished higher than fourth with the sure. same team but again it's, they're not really competitive with like 100 thieves and tl and cloud nine but the problem is like the, that's the biggest failure of the sword art move he not only wasn't a very good individual player but he obviously wasn't doing some great shot calling was he which is the whole reason you fucking signed the guy now i would say that in itself bear in mind bjergsen's been involved with every lineup that they've had that failed with mega shot callers i'd start to ask questions it's like with the junglers they've finally got one jungler that worked really really well Sven Skeren was sort of like half and half. I'd ask yourself this question. How come my teams where great shot callers go to die and be ineffective? Like, who is who is affecting this? I don't know if it's Bjergsen. I don't know if it's Reginald. I don't know if it's the culture and the fan expectations. But something makes shot callers just not work anymore. It's like that fucking guy in that old show, Heroes, where he was the Haitian. His ability was, when he's around superheroes, their ability don't work anymore. That's what it feels like when fucking Bjergsen's in these teams. So I think they would be a slightly better team. I always had my questions about his shot calling, quite frankly. So I think they would be better. But yeah, that's an issue that they're going to have in the squad. Like this split, they just look like they just made the band-aids. They said, like, right, Power Reveal, you play these three champions. Huni, you play these three champions. Spicker just has to play whatever's available. And then the bot lane does whatever the fuck the bot lane does. So like they looked like they had very limited idea of how to play the game. It just worked against most teams, especially the teams with the subs. If they want to actually mix it up, you know, with like Mad Lions or something. They're going to have to get way better in that regard. So I think another problem they have is it's called the sunken cost fallacy. If I'm Reginald, if you really believe that that FTX money is going to be there and you're going to get 10 years in and get 200 million, then just fucking get rid of Sword Art. Admit you were wrong. Get rid of it. You're never going to sell him for his value. No idiots paying that. Maybe someone would pay half a million or something and bring him back to like fucking PCS or LS, LPL or whatever. Maybe, maybe. But I personally think it's like in sports. Sometimes in sports, you fuck up with a big contract and you have to just take it on the chin and let the guy go and just start over. So I personally would say, if you bring Bjergsen back, get rid of Sword Art as well. Actually bring in someone who, who can do some shot calling, who has a half a brain, you know. Yeah, I, if they actually, I would just go whole revamp. I'd sell everyone but Bjergsen and Speaker and then just, build around three new players the trouble is this is the one year where it actually makes sense to keep Hooney if you're an NA org because he's got NA residency now and so if you think of NA top laners I mean he would be one of the best wouldn't he like ignoring imports he would be one of the better players so I think unfortunately you probably have to keep Hooney so yeah I'm with you look the only players I would keep is for for that reason alone I might keep Hooney he's still a decent player Spicker actually is very good I'd keep him of course and then if you have Bjergsen cool. you've got three good players there the question is what are you doing for the bot lane you know and I do feel like not least because they're about to just replace Power of Evil you think about how Kobe's time went there how Sven's time went there how Mithy mate there's, I think there's a lot of EU talent who might go to America if they can get an offer from Cloud9 or Team Liquid but the offer from TSM 
nah, you can keep that, mate. I don't, don't know if I'm going to go and do that. I'd rather even be in the fifth best LEC team and sort of just hope I get a miracle run, you know. I do well because Bjergsen and Speak are both non imports, you have greater import capabilities, right? So you, you can import Sony a whole bot lane, yeah, yeah, or not right, and you can obviously bot. replace Sony, yeah, yeah, sure. I do think the other thing is people talk about a lot is like replacing supports with old mid laners. Well, I mean, that's even another angle where if you're Bjergsen, you could have returned, right? Obviously, some people thought you might return as a jungler, it's just that that's no point in that because we've got Speak now. I, Pete, I don't know if you know this, but uh, like a year ago, when basically Nuke Duck was on the way out, that was a rumor of Nuke Duck because I think he actually had one split where he was trying to like practice it a bit. That maybe he would just become a support player because again, obviously, first of all, if you're a mid laner, your mechanics are going to be fine for support. Secondly, you're supposed to know more about roaming and map play because you're a mid laner. And then thirdly, you've got all the experience, haven't you? It's like the high factor where they kept swapping him around in Cloud Nine. Yeah, I don't hate that move. I don't hate the move of bringing someone in. It's just the question would be who would it be that you're going to get as a support in that sense? You know, unless it's Bjergsen himself, which apparently isn't going to be. Do you have any suggestions? Somebody who could roll swap. I mean, they did it with Huey, I guess, right? Yeah, I, I just the the silly one is just get golden glue. But, yeah, maybe maybe Golden Glue or Poor Belter. You're like, yeah, listen, boys, you do, you wanna, do you actually want to play in the rest of your career? Because here's the thing. Those are people, as far as I know, you know, like they, they're professionals. They're diligent players. They do the practice. It's just, I think the problem is, traditionally, mid lane is the most important carry role. So you have to basically, when you go to the world-class level, you're playing against Chovy and fucking, you know, Knight and Rookie. Like, if you're just good on the LCS level, like Poor Belter is... Yeah, you're going to get your shit pushed in, mate. Like, that's just... Sorry, that's not my fault, but you're just in the, the hardest role. That's like trying to play shooting guard in the NBA and then you're playing against Kobe Bryant every night. Like, yeah, he's going to smash your head in, mate. You're not going to, you're not going to be good enough. If that's the one position where we can't, we're probably going to have a hard time, aren't we? I mean, I would be very impressed if they actually took the, the plunge and, and took away Sword Art, but I, I really don't believe they it. They won't do it, mate. After spending so much money to yeah, be... Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'll, I'll be impressed, even though you know, I'm not a fan, but that, that would be that would show some balls, but I doubt it. It's like I always say every year, one of the things I hate about TSM fans, mate, is every split, there's a period where they say that the lineup's good. And I'm like, okay, I'm with you. Let's sign them for three years and make no roster moves. Then they always make roster moves when they don't win. And then the fans back again, like, now the lineup's the best. Like, Fuck you. You said that like two months ago, mate. Like, I don't know if people know this, but at the end of playoffs, everyone's like, ah, well, TSM, they didn't have a good enough lineup this year and PoE's too limited and what the fuck was Lost doing. Those same TSM fans, when they were first place, they were insufferable if you go to their subreddit. Like, they really believed they had this shit. They were like, oh, it doesn't matter that team look good in Alfari and that, like, that doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, you look at the record, like, we've got the best record. Like, they really believed it. So, sadly, I always say, look, if you think a player's good who I think's bad, then go ahead, mate, and sign him for a five year. It's like Lucky and Astralis. Like, if you want to keep telling me the guy's great, shut the fuck up and sign him. Just play with him for two years. I'll be the one laughing at the end of two years, but if you want to prove me wrong, don't go, oh, but he is really brilliant, like BMAS was in fucking phase, and then go, but actually I'm going to kick him because I'd rather play with someone good. Like, well, fuck you. You can't have, to sit, you can't have your cake and eat it, as it were, you know? Yeah, meanwhile, every other team is like, I hope we got TSM in playoffs. <laughs> sure. Shit. Actually, that thing, this support swap actually prompted the question, like in historical terms, is any player that, that you remember retired and came back to the top, well, one of the GOATs, well, at least Western GOATs, let's say, um, retired and came back? Obviously, you know, RPK went to supportive role, but um, I, I think it's rare and unlikely that... that Retiring and coming. I don't back. think retiring because the problem is, I always say, if you retire, it's usually for a bunch of reasons. Like real life's more important. You hate practicing. You're not as good anymore, and you can't win. Like usually, whatever reason made you retire, that reason will just manifest six months into your comeback, and you go, "Oh shit, yeah, that's actually why." Like here's another reason that's very sad. Some people retire because they don't care about the game anymore. Then they go into real life and work in a fucking car phone warehouse, which is like a shop that sells mobile phones, and then they go, "Shit." Yeah, I didn't like the game, but actually I'm nobody in real life, whereas I was sort of a minor celebrity. So then they come back, and it's like, those are the worst people ever to pick up. So unfortunately, I can't think of anyone in Counter-Strike or League that like straight up retired and came back and was really good. I think the closest is just people who went in slumps and then 
motivation dipped and then they got the shit back there. Like the most obvious example to me is probably like fucking Guardian and FaZe Clan. If you remember at the end of that Navi, not obviously the one yep. last one he had, he was a bit whack. Like Simple was carrying like a motherfucker and Guardian was just like a decent AWPA. And then he went to FaZe Clan and like the next day it was like he'd gone back in a time machine three years. He was wrecking everyone yep. again. He was like, what the fuck? So I think it's more like, you know, you've got to keep your foot in a little bit. You've got to keep some sort of like a... Uh, you got to have some sort of like form in that sense. I put it this way: I, I could only do it if we go outside of esports. So the, I think one of the few examples would maybe be in MMA. If you know the fighter Dominic Cruz, who was like a champion, and then he had loads of injuries for like three or four years, but then he came back and won the title again. So like, it can rarely happen. But in esports, particularly, it doesn't really feel like it's a thing. And also, we've got so many people competing in esports that like, there's a million people go for your job. So it's pretty hard. It's not. It's not as limited in that sense. Have we got another topic? It can be about league, right, if you want. But I'm just going to say, Zach probably wants it not to be about league. So, uh, Mitt, do you have a topic, Zach? Uh, sure. Thanks for... Thanks. Um, I have one in Counter-Strike where the last time that the in-game economy was changed, I remember there was a lot of discussion in the scene of, like, what do we want changed and how to change it? And this time, of course, I still think the economy needs changing now with the modern in-game economy, but I haven't seen as much discussion around it. Like, I definitely agree that the yes. first round loss bonus is a big problem, but is it as easy as just removing it or what else needs to be done? Yeah, the main problem is, you notice people in general don't have a lot of abstract discussions in Counter-Strike. They don't talk about like the bigger picture very often. They just talk about super specific things. Like, what's mad is you can release a change and just be like, I've made the Glock a hundred dollars. Nah, I guess the Glock's not a good one because no one buys it. The US, the US, the P250. I've made the P250 one hundred dollars cheaper, and people discuss that like that was like fucking the Ten Commandments coming down from Mount Sinai. And it's like fucking hell. This is it. What? What does it mean though? Whereas, to, what's the bizarre is I agree. When you have a busted economy like we do, how is that not the topic every week? How is that not what every pro is tweeting at the CS:GO account and John McDonald and these people who you can theory access? How is that not the discussion point that you can have but for some reason it isn't so to me the main problem is this there are certain premises baked into counter-strike that the problem is valve if you've ever heard them talk about balancing maps fans do this as well they think a balanced map is a map that's eight seven on both halves whereas that isn't like a balanced map is one where there's a logic to how it plays. And then in my opinion, you balance it by the map pool. Like you have three maps that are T-sided, you have three maps that are CT-sided, you have like one map that's in the middle. If that's how you balance a map pool, you just make the maps good. Because obviously there's some fantastic maps, classically nuke, that are CT-sided, right? You wouldn't want that to be 8-7 every half. Meanwhile, if you play on something like Inferno, you probably do want it to be 8-7. That's why it's the classic decider map, right? Anything can happen on any side. So to me, I think the problem is they make this weird assumption that like, Every team should have like a uh, similar like win bonus for the round, for example. It says who? I mean, for example, CT economy is more expensive because the Molotov is more expensive. You have to have more utility to hold the positions. You have to have diffuse kits. Your rifles are more expensive than the AK. You tend to have ops on CT side more. So in my opinion, on CT side, you probably need to win more money for winning the round. You probably, I, I think an obvious way to do it, by the way, at the moment, since every fucker saves when they're in like a 3v4, 3v5, make it so you get an even bigger bonus for a defusal. Because remember, the terrorists get the bomb down all the time because they want the extra money. So now give me more money for defusing. That'll even things up. That'll make it interesting. The real problem is this. We've had two major economies in CSGO. We have the current one, which just basically just says to the CTs, good luck, it's one and a half times harder to play your side and you better not win that pistol and then lose the second round or you're a dickhead for having bought SMGs. There's that economy, which I despise, even though it does make for a lot of exciting games. And then the other, because it's basically who can punish T-side on T-side harder. And the other economy, the old one, had that stupid flaw with it where it was all about like three or four rounds and a half would break the money, the opponent's economy entirely. And so it was all about, do you gamble on those? Did you win those if they're straight up gun rounds? Obviously, we want something in the middle. So like I say, my suggestions are more along the lines of like, kind of even up how much the sides get relative to what they need in a competitive game, have maps that are like sometimes imbalanced but balanced in the map pool which makes it more fun in that regard 
I think there's subtle things you can do to change, but there's also another thing about Valve and CSGO for some stupid reason. It's never a 1% or a 5% change. It's always like 25% change to this or minus 25%. You're like, holy fuck, mate. This is just, you're just throwing the meta completely out of whack all over the place. So I'd, I'm very cynical about whether that'll change, but I have some some sort of like fringe ideas as to what could help change it a bit, you know. Do you have any ideas? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I'm thinking of the yeah changes from the the last economy update where the complaint was there were those three or four rounds where you would get the hard reset to the CT economy and then oops we can't play Inferno CT side this this map right. But after discussing it and debating it, finally they uh, added that like round uh, little tally right where instead of having a full reset, it just goes down by one and, and things like that when you're winning, so you don't get hard reset yes. anymore. So we kind of like identified the problem and then also solved it in a way. But like you said, Valve just went all in and said, also, we're going to fix everything else we imagined to be a problem all at the same time. And then that's, yeah, where the, uh, you know, first round loss bonus causes the uh, so many problems. So I don't know. That's why I'm kind of, um, yeah, hypothesizing. Maybe it's just as easy as removing that or maybe it's not. But it's also, like you said, where it's so hard to get these things changed in any kind of way where, Maybe that's why the the analysts and all, all the broadcasts now are so jaded, where they're like, "Oh, oh with is. the economy now." So uh, anyway, I guess it's not even worth talking about, and we just move on. The other brutal thing is this, and luckily it's Valve, so I'll say they're in general fairly chill about criticism. They're not they're not going to overreact like Riot and ban me from everything. There's no one who works at Valve who knows, like, no one at Valve could participate in this conversation we're having right now. They don't understand the game on that level. On some level, they are making a game for the matchmaking idiot. Like, that's that's just unfortunately the reality of the game we live in. In fact, game devs in general don't really see esports the way we do. It's like it's a whole circuit. Of sport. They see it as like, right, well, you know, there's the best players and I'll reward them. But, you know, they're still just players and they're like anyone else. And uh, everyone has to have the game for them. Like, you know, it's, a, it's for everyone. And so in that world, you're never going to really address these topics. It's why another thing that to me is an obvious slam dunk move is you need to have some sort of community liaison at someone from the community. Like, by the way, I'm not saying make it me. I wouldn't even fucking want to do the job, mate. Make it, like, pray this way. If it was someone, assuming they wanted to do the gig, if it was, like, Sponge, Richard Lewis, if these people wanted to do that gig, could be a part-time gig even, that'd be amazing. They could take these ideas to Valve. They could point out to Valve, oh, this change you're about to make. I can understand for, like, a pleb in a... A matchmaking game with, with no stacks, maybe he'll think it's fun, but actually it might throw, you know, some issues in at the pro level. And a couple of pros have told me they consider about this. I think that would be awesome if you could just have a dialogue and at least get some of the ideas through. Because I also get the feeling they don't model what Counter-Strike is anything like we do. Yeah, yeah they're, they're probably happy. It's everything is 16-14 and maybe their metrics are good. There's less people... In a fucked up world, in theory, yeah. that probably helps viewership, right? It means people keep watching the whole time and then they watch overtime or some dark angle like that, right? Yeah, or they don't even quit. Get, like, maybe if you're 10-0 down before, you'd rage quit. And now you don't rage quit because you might come back in yes, any game. that's true. So maybe for them, this is better. But yeah, obviously, we don't care about matchmaking plebs, but that's what they care about. Yeah, there's the other thing. If they run the numbers for matchmaking, they're never going to get anywhere close to pro play. Because if you've played matchmaking even recently, dude, even though some of these people must have been playing for like four years, there's people still buying on the wrong round or fucking buying a shotgun and two smokes or, and a smoke and a flash on CT <laughs> side with, with just Kevlar. Like, there's people doing shit like that still in matchmaking. Or on T side, it's the round that you all buy AKs, but he's still got a MAC-10. Like, there's still shit like that going on. So unfortunately, if you run the numbers, you're going to get a really weird sense of what balance between the weapons and the economy is, you know? Yeah, generally, I think enforced parity is just generally a bad idea. I'd like to see more, like, I think you said that Nuke was at least like a, what there was a, a one-sided map, so I yes. think that's more interesting when you see like a side where you're not supposed to win. Exactly. Fifty-fifty. Where it's more interesting to watch someone. It's like you need to win at least three T rounds, and that's what's expected. So then it's it's a lot more dynamic, and I think that's a lot more fun to watch than the sixteen fourteens every game. If people remember in 2018 when Astralis was basically the best team to ever play CSGO, the defining image of them is playing Nuke 
and winning the T-side when it was a CT-sided map before this economy change. Like, that is what told you that they were the GOATs because they literally were on, like, a 24 or 23 map win streak on it. It's already a map that's really hard. And they were just beating everyone on the T-side half the time because, obviously, since they would pick Nuke, everyone else would go, well, I pick CT-side to start on. So they start on the harder side, win that, totally mentally crush you and then just smash you on CT side so yeah there's a perfect example of what made that amazing if you go back a few years before when they brought out the rework of train you had teams like Virtus Pro Navi like even though on paper that in matchmaking is a CT sided map they were like winning the T half so you were like now I know this team's fucking amazing whereas in the current meta look there are certainly teams sometimes Navi on CT side do it themselves but there are a lot of times where it's like are they actually that good or is the map just like a lot more forgiving on this side or is the economy just against the CTs or did they just lose the, you know, there's there's sort of factors that sort of take away some of the, almost like the prestige of what you're doing in the game, you know, you know, it's not as hard. Yeah, the other thing on the economy that we I said last time was just like bring change the format yourself. So like charges only is a good way to just get around the economy issue. So that's just another point. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, time. that would be another great one, yeah, because obviously in that scenario, if you don't know, on T-side, you can just do a bunch of Glock rushes, die really quickly, just use very little time on the clock, and then right back to a gun round. Yeah, that's another way you could essentially, without need involve, manage the economy. But unfortunately, again, this this is why, on the one hand, shows like this are good, but on the one hand, they're depressing, because you come up with these good ideas, and then you know they're never going to be implemented. So, charges only. The problem is, it's a fucking wicked format. I'm telling you, even three months in, I guarantee loads of fans and almost all the pros would know why would we playing this for the whole time the trouble is just to get them to adopt it initially is the entire battle and unfortunately at the moment like i said tos are followers as well they're not going to let esl do the normal thing that people because remember people are going to be mega resistant to the change they're not going to go well i'll just gamble my whole circuit on it even though by the way it would make sense for like blast or someone to do it because they're not even in that great a financial position but again sadly you, you're looking around and you're going, who's going to go first? And then unfortunately, no one wants to go first. You know, we're basically playing a matchmaking fucking T side of Mirage here. Yeah, I think this is, goes back to the monetization thing we said. If you, if you had like an invitational only, charges only map for the mega fans that you then pay yes. to exceed, then maybe you'd get enough money to then actually run that as like a. Certainly a good idea. Yeah. I mean, I don't. One thing I definitely don't get is. Can't we at least have it on a small level? Like, can't we have like you know a tier two thing like this that a bunch of them playing on the side and you just put enough prize money in that they play it as well as the other? Can't we at least sort of make some inroads, you know? Because I do think that's a very underrated potential cure for the game. Not least because it's a loads more TV friendly. The halves last twenty minutes, assuming you pick the old classic time. You know that means a game can never be more than forty minutes unless it's overtime. And by the way, you'll get way less overtimes. You get a lot more overtimes in max rounds because it's just like. It's 14 14, and depending on certain maps, it's really hard to get two rounds in a row, isn't it? Or the economy means you win one and then the other guy still has enough money to buy or whatever, you know? So I think actually it would actually even help out the timing, the scheduling. I think it's an awesome mode. By the way, all the great in game leaders would have a fucking field day. People like Glaive, Carrigan, Lexi B, all these guys, they'd be fucking loving it, mate. Meanwhile, the people who would just bang average IGLs, well, they can't get lucky and just have their AWP win them three rounds. They actually have to show over 20 minutes what their fucking playbook is and what they can do. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like something I could go venture capitalist for take my own charges only tournament. Yeah, the big problem is basically, unfortunately, the kind of businessman who can get in the room with the venture capitalist guy who'll give him 10 million is just the guy selling the fucking semi bullshit dream who's in a current top org. It's not unfortunately me, Monty, Richard. We unfortunately we don't get in those rooms. Like we only get to meet those people once they're already in esports, and half the time they have to get fucked over by someone else or do all the wrong moves for one year, and then they privately message us like can you consult and tell me what I'm doing? Like, so, almost like that, you know. So, unfortunately, we don't really get to those people at first. And so, yeah, it's been tough to do those things. Even when we were at Ely, it was really tough to get them to implement our ideas because their whole philosophy was like, look, this is TV and you aren't from TV. And it's like, well, you're right, but I'm also trying to do something different with the game. You know, I'm trying to create something here. So, that is it. that's another, I mean, it's, a, it's basically almost like a politics problem. You know, we haven't got the networking at the right level or we don't promote the right people. 
Do we have one last topic? I think we do one big, one last topic and then we wrap it up. Someone have a good one? Can be anything. I had uh, just a little one of cold zero to complexity. All right. I come at this from the angle that was, um, this is one where I'm just confused because to me, complexity is one of those teams like G2 where they have at least some idea what they're doing from a general manager perspective. But do you remember they had a uh, blame F who's like the lurker baiter player. And then they brought in JKS. He's like, Hey gang, I'm going to be the lurker baiter. And now yeah. to have cold Zara as third on deck is uh, scratching my head a little bit. Oh, I agree. I think it's stupid as fuck. Like, that's an example of where, like, who is the GM of this team? Like, is it actually Jason Lake? Like, what? what's the thinking? Because I agree with you. You've got three players who basically all want the same level of resources and to be the passive player at the back. And the problem goes like this. First of all, JKS just can't fucking do it. Like, apparently he's only ever done it in one team, ever. Blame F sort of can do it, but the problem is he's the IGL, so it means I think he actually baits a little bit. It decreases how good he is as an IGL. And then Cold Zera, maybe he could do it. I think his ego has got in the way of him the last few years. And I think he definitely took for granted how tailored people like Taco were to his game when he was in MIBR. But maybe he can get back there. So my problem is, how can you have all three in the same team at once? Like, think about the other two players. Okay, Esetag can definitely be an entry type player. He's, he's got that skill. Poison's your AWPer and is sort of an aggressive AWPer. But even so, like, there's not enough riflers that are sort of going forwards in this team. Like, I feel like you're just going to run the clock down a fucking million times in this squad. So I don't, I don't particularly like it myself. I think you've sort of stacked too many of the same sort of players. With that said, I will say, again, a rumour that is behind the scenes is maybe a bunch of the Astralis players and Zonic make a package deal and that's being shopped to a bunch of teams. So I'm sure complexity is in the mix there. Maybe teams like G2 and Faze are in the mix there. So there's maybe a world where you go all Danish lineup or something like that. You know, I don't know. I mean, in this case, you just signed called zeros. It's probably not great in that regard, but yeah, I don't, I don't really know what the future is for complexity. And I'll also add this in as well. The rumor about config basically not returning when his injury is finished. It's real. Like, there's a world where conflict just never plays for complexity. Again. And I think that's really sad because, again, he provided so much sort of up-tempo play and he was a fucking banging player. So at this point, I don't really know you can replace guys like that. And they definitely haven't so far. Anyone else got any thoughts on Cole? I mean, the thing is, Coldzera was one of, was the best player in the world at some point. And there's only like five of those. And there might never be another one because Simple might be the one until the end. True. So people are star fuckers. Like Jason, like, you know, he has his ideas, but if he got this chance, he just took it. And it's like, okay, yes. we'll figure it out later. But we could get Coldzera. Like very few people can say that. Uh, gets right and all of our are out. So there's basically him as I went Simple and uh, there's no one else. So I think that's it. That's the only explanation because, like you say, by roles, it makes zero sense. Uh, by the way, I don't even hate that angle, though. Like, I do think when someone's been a truly great player, assuming they don't become actually objectively shit in the server and give up, like, you know, practicing, I don't hate the idea that, like, you know, the guy who has, like, the 10th best team who says, well, I'll gamble that maybe you have a few more seasons in you. Sometimes that works. You know, like I said, with the Guardian on phase angle, like... He really did resurrect himself and become amazing. And that's why for like four months, that team was OP as fuck. Because you had prime Nico, prime Carrigan, and prime fucking Cold Zero. Uh, that fucking um, Guardian. And it was like, holy shit, this is, this is so much. So with really great players, it's why I think when lands come back, someone's got to take a chance on Kenny S. Maybe someone has to try Guardian, you know. It's just obviously you don't do it if you're like the third best team in the world. You do it if you are more in the vein of a complexity, fanatic... These sorts of squads, mouse sports, these are the sorts of squads that should probably take the gamble. Because as you say, when someone's been to that peak at the top, they might not get there again. But let's be real, if Cold Zero was 85% of Cold Zero, mate, that would be a very good player. And you could definitely build a squad around him. I mean, he had a, he had a super durable playing style, you know. Yeah. Isn't JKS on like a mega contract too, though? Yeah, unfortunately... I think that's the only reason he would... Because basically he's had offers in the past from NA teams. I think that's the only reason he left that squad. And quite frankly, I wonder if he regrets it now. Like, I wonder if he just wishes he was back in extreme mum and he didn't have this pressure on him. Because there's another thing. One thing, it's hard to gauge until someone's been there. But if, if you know sports, 
There's a big difference between being the star player on a mid-table team and then getting to sign for like Chelsea or fucking go to the Lakers in basketball or join the fucking Dallas Cowboys in the NFL. Like that pressure is real. And if you've never experienced it before, you don't know how you'll hold up under that. Suddenly it ain't that much fun because now you lose a game that in your old team, they're like, well, that was the best team they were playing and he still played well. Now you lose the game and it's like, why didn't you win the game for us? Especially when, as you're saying, people know you're on an enormous contract. Like you're getting big money. Because right now, I mean, JK is one of the most overpaid players in the world. Let's just be real. Like he hasn't lived up to the billing, has he? He's just an okay player. He's actually, in theory, one of the worst, worst players in the team. So doesn't really justify that money, quite frankly. But then again, there's also certain players who right now are too loyal. Like, I'll give you an example. I was trying to talk my boy Valde into leaving OG and going to maybe one of these teams, some other squad. Because again, I think that's a piece that you really can use, like upgrade. But for whatever reason, he wanted to stay with the boys in OG. And I think it was more about, like, you know, if we get some on paper upgrades, I'll just keep believing in this squad. So there are players you can replace people like that with, in my opinion. It's just, I'll also add this in. I actually also get the vibe in complexity. Like think about how many stand-ins they've had to use over the last fucking year. Like there was Oboe, then there was Poison, then there was fucking uh, Config now. Like, mate, if I'm paying all that money and putting all this investment into the team, I can't just be getting like three month spans and then I have to have like a downtime while everyone else just gets the team for the whole fucking time. So I also worry, quite frankly, that complexity might feel fucking burned by some of these massive moves they've made, just, especially if Config leaves. Like, mate, I've resurrected your career in my team and paid you handsomely, and then you just use that as a fucking stepping stone to go to Australis. Fuck off. Like, that would actually burn me, you know. Any more thoughts? Do we have one last topic to finish? Are we leaving it on that? Which I is got, it going to be? I got one quick Let's one. do it. So... Fanatic and Adam at the top laner. I know Wicked really brings him up, but he has the bruiser only like champion yes. pool. But there's so many bruisers in the game that you can't really ban him out. So do you no, think no. it's possible that you this guy can just play this type of champion the entire way and not have to learn different styles? He can, like, put it this way. I just did a video about the guy today, so I don't even give this contrast. He could just sort of be the Vizichachi of Fnatic, right? He could just play bruisers and then... You don't have to give him too many resources. Some games he'll do well because he's just a specialist in certain matchups and it allows your mid and your AD carry to kind of be the ones that get the resources and go off. Okay, that's not a terrible idea. My problem is just this. For where Fnatic is financially and the fact that at the moment they don't attract big talent, it's actually, he's an appropriate player for them to gamble on and to be in their team. I'm totally fine with that. My issue is just, he's either still got like a year of development to go or there are just better top players out there. Like, so I think my issue is just that I think you've sort of seen what you're going to see. I think he's pretty good, but it's just like above average at the moment. I think you've seen what you're going to see from him. To people like Wicked, maybe they think either he's better or, you know, next split he'll get even better. Like they might be doing that local thing where every fucking rookie just has to like double in skill and performance every split, even though that's not a real thing. So I think, I think in Fnatic it makes sense, but I do think he's pretty overhyped. I'd also love to see a world where you know, the top lane was just all carries or something. We just go to some crazy met like that. And then how, how was he going to hold up in that? Don't really know about that, you know. Yeah, I'll probably get wrecked in Worlds and get a bit back down. But I could see a world where he gets shit on at Worlds, yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, I do think it's good that at least now you have like, okay, a few voices in the team and he's probably one of the quiet ones. Probably when they had, you know, the other louder voices, it was too many. So in a sense, I think it's good that not everyone in the team has to be the, the best player. If I had to guess, he's probably pretty quiet because if you yeah. know French players, they tend to also just like irrationally be afraid that their English is shit for some reason <laughs> that usually is fine. Yeah. This video was kindly supported by Chris with a K, Lager15, Matt Pugnacio, Dracula, Skaparan, Travis Goff, Zach Smid, Adam Oaks, Alexander Rao, Animosity, Bot Pounder 420, Chris, Eric Hillerstad, Hades, J Dobbs, Jensen Go, John Shelton, Joseph Ginsburg, Kovacevic, Tobias Bernasconi, Zumba, Zyrathenia, and special thanks go out to both Jerky's Minion and DZL. 
Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for some of my content? You want to ask me a question in one of those video AMAs? Do you want teasers? Who's going to be the guests on my next interviews? Do you want to take part in a lengthy esports discussion with me? Well, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Skulluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.